Hello. Welcome to today's webinar, A Galaxy Far, Far Away, Why Leo PNT is Closer to Reality Than You Think, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Arolia Defense and Security. Before we begin, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. Other upcoming webinars will also be posted to this page. Please notice the Q&A panel at the lower left-hand side of your console. If you have a question, please type it into the panel's text box then click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Questions submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered during the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel on your screen to submit your issue and technical support specialist Marie Emmerich or I will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, and email address in the panel on the lower left or on the upper left-hand side of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the share this widget you'll see in the bottom right corner of your screen. Finally, the resources panel hosts the slides for today's presentation, which you may download, as well as links to both GPS and Arolia's website. I'm Mackenzie Shoemaker from North Coast Media, Content Marketing Project Manager for GPS World, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today, we will be hearing from Brian Chan, Patrick Shannon, Zach Cassis, and Alaya Tuntamiki Winter. Brian is the GP, excuse me, Brian is the VP of Business Development and Strategy at Zona Space Systems. He has been working in the aerospace sector for over a decade. Prior to founding Trustpoint, Patrick was the Vice President at Astro Digital, where he was a five-time satellite program manager and responsible for strategy formulation, business development, and product development. Zach is a full professor at The Ohio State University and director of the U.S. Department of Transportation Center, Carmen. And Alaya is an Applications Engineer at Arolia Defense and Security. I will now pass it over to Brian Chan, VP of Development and Strategy at Zona Space Systems. Brian, take it away. Okay, fantastic. I guess a quick check. check. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, great. Thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, happy to talk a bit about Zona uh, as well as Leo PNT in general. So before uh, talking Zona, I just like to kind of share uh, my view at least on uh, Leo PNT. You know uh, wh why we're talking about it now, why is it important, and why should we care really, right? So uh, maybe a quick kind of history lesson here. Um, GPS. Let's, let's start with GPS, right? It was designed in the 1970s. The first satellite was launched in 1978. Um, the the set of requirements for GPS back then are certainly very different than than they are now. Um, back then, right, the it was uh, designed by the Air Force for the DoD specifically. Um, the famous tagline was that you know, it would have to drop five bombs in the same hole. Uh, it was it was a global it needed to be uh, globally available. It had to be resistant to a state level actor. Uh, of course, you had the DoD government defense budget to actually run the program itself. Um, user equipment was portable, uh, meaning you know not <laughs> too small, but just something that you could say drive around in the car. And the the space layer had to go two weeks without ground contact. It effectively had to survive a nuclear blast. Uh, and 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 the satellites and the space layer could could still operate without. So clearly, you know, there's a lot of redundancies in the systems, a lot of you know great design work that had to happen to meet those requirements. If we fast forward to today. Um, you know, 50 years later, satin after today looks very different. The requirement set's extremely different, um, all right? So there's certainly a lot of huge commercial interest. Um, today, 90% of all GPS devices are commercial. Um, a lot of that is, is due to cell phones that we, we have in our pockets today. 
um, accuracy levels down to the centimeter at this point, you know, people are actually today paying for centimeter level GPS corrections uh, as as a testament to that. Uh, availability is still global. Uh, resistance to interference, well, today's environment, at least the RF environment, is extraordinarily noisy. Uh, cyber attacks are only increasing and in, in, um, getting more complex. Uh, from a, a cost perspective, of course, you know, when we talk about commercial companies such as Zonas uh, doing this, it obviously needs to be commercially viable. The user equipment needs to go um, mass market, so we're talking, you know, billions of, of devices here. And there has to be no uh, external dependencies on existing GPS or GNSS. So, you know, when you take a look at this, like side by side, clearly, you know, the, the requirement set is different. And what that means is uh, the architectures for, for uh, P&T are, are look quite different as well. And so I'll walk through that really quickly here. Um, so GNSS, I think most folks um, have, have seen this before, but basically, you know, GPS and GNSS in general, you have about 30 satellites in medium Earth orbit uh, that are broadcasting a one-way uh, signal down to the end user. Uh, it, GNSS is essentially a very fancy time dissemination system, right? So all the clocks on uh, on, or, on on orbit as well as on the ground are, are uh, synchronized. You've got um, atomic clocks uh, down on the ground for GPS. It's at USNO uh, on the East Coast there. Uh, and you also have a very high-end equipment in space. So you've got rad hard equipment that can survive the, um, you know, the, the space environment with all the radiation. You have a set of atomic clocks that are, you know, very high performance, very expensive, uh, very power uh, hungry. And you also have these shorter term um, crystal oscillators uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that, that the signal goes through. So again, the, the, this was all uh, back in the 70s, like right when, when the architecture was, was created. This was at a time when launch vehicles were really not, SpaceX certainly didn't exist, right? There were very limited launch vehicle operations, uh, limited uh, uh, ecosystem when it came to airspace or air satellite uh, bus design development houses, right? And so it made sense that they were, you wanted to launch fewer satellites and you wanted uh, more performance out of each satellite or, or more that more that it could do. So so this architecture certainly made a lot of sense at the time and, and obviously is very relevant today. Um, when we look at sort of SatNav for today and, and what I presented, it, the architecture looks quite different. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it starts making a lot of sense to launch smaller satellites in low Earth orbit simply because there's more uh, launch vehicle options. The new space ecosystem of, you know, satellites rolling off of assembly lines is, is here. It's here now. Um, and so at least from a uh, financial viability sense, this this does make a lot um, of sense. But, you know, there's a lot of advantages from, from a P&T perspective when you have low Earth orbiting satellites. For, for one, they travel across the sky much faster, so you know you get better convergence times. The received power on the ground is significantly higher, just because uh, Leo satellites are about you know 20 to 25 times closer uh, than than those in Neo. Um, and you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, nods you can turn from an architecture standpoint, such as you know there are redundancies in the, the quantity of satellites. There's redundancies in the crosslinks if you decide to have them between the satellites. Um, and on and on. And so I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that, at least how, how we designed it and the features that uh, that we can provide with um, with our Zona system. So that's the landscape um, as I see it at least. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to my co-presenters also discussing um, their perspectives on this. So um, transitioning into Zona here, so at Zona, you know, our tagline is satellite navigation for the age of autonomy. Uh, our mission is to enable modern tech to operate safely in any environment anywhere on Earth. And our method for doing so is really by providing the world's most accurate and resilient uh, position navigation and timing services. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this, the, the tagline in the next chart here. So GPS or PNT in general, I mean, it's arguably the, the most impactful space-based technology, right? We have 8 billion devices that are currently using GNSS. 
um, over a tremendous uh, number of markets and verticals that all want kind of different things. Uh, and, you know, the, my job for the better part of uh, two or so years now has really been talking to all these folks within industry to see what, what they're looking for, see what, what interests them, and see what how, how they could be um, – you get with better B and T. How could that enable their business, right? And so, you know, in general, we found that the most stringent P and T performance requirements actually comes from the automotive and autonomy markets. And so, effectively, if we can address the self-driving car folks and, and their needs, including not only technical but also um, from a kind of financial perspective and even scaling perspective of you know, tens of millions of vehicles on the road every new new vehicles on the road every year, we can actually cover the vast majority of other end users. So, you know, we're talking about you know folks that want uh, precision accuracy for 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 um, position and timing. They want um, they want frequency diversity. They want uh, high availability globally. They want and they want it all at an extremely low price. Um, and so. You know, if we can do that, we effectively can cover all the markets that you see here and, and more, actually. Um, and so diving into our system, so Zona Pulsar is, is our uh, constellation and is our service that really represents the next generation of uh, P&T from low Earth orbit. And so, you know, with the architecture that we've put together and, you know, all the um, we believe we can really provide a lot of bells and whistles to to the market. And so here are four things that, that um, stand out to us. So for one, the service itself uh, is multi-band um, and is over 100 times more powerful than Gina Thessa Day as well as 10 times more accurate. And this is, you know, out of the box, so to speak, right? There's no kind of external um, service required or there's no, you know, Gina Thessa is not required for, for these kinds of uh, accuracies that, we, that I'm talking about here, at least to the end, certainly not to the end user. Um, from a security perspective, uh, at least with with civil uh, signals, it's entirely open um, and it's very easily uh, hacked or spoofed, jammed, etc. This is a huge problem for folks that say want to use uh, GNSS for safety critical applications, right, such as a person in a very fast moving vehicle, you don't want to be using or certainly you don't want to trust a signal that's entirely open. And so, you know, we're innovating at the RF level to to do that, right? Where we're adding uh, encryption and authentication layers to really um, to really provide that kind of integrity uh, to, to folks that need it. Um, enhancement data. So there's actually in-band data uh, in, in the RF signal itself that enhances and augment, augments existing GNSS performance. Um, an easy example is, is uh, corrections. The folks that are looking for, you know, centimeter level positioning, that's something that we can provide with the in-band data. Um, and, and GNSS independence. <clears throat> so, you know, because we uh, are designing everything from the ground up, we have the latitude to really ensure that everything from our system uh, can operate fully independently. Right, so this is um, starting from the space layer, from the Leo layer, but even down to the to the ground layer and, and everything in between. So, how does this actually work as a business? Uh, well, the way we can think about this is, you know, we're really developing the uh, PNT infrastructure. Uh, which includes the ground segment, which includes the safe space segment, uh, beaming down, broadcasting our signals and our service to end users on the ground. From there, we work with the receiver manufacturers to integrate uh, our technology into their products to then offer a high performance service for their customers and for the end users. Um, a big example of this is you know, we, we recently announced a partnership with Hexagon Novatel. Um, you know, they're a premier uh, receiver manufacturer that, you know, builds uh, these, these, these high-end receivers for all sorts of applications. Um, and so they've really seen the, uh, the value that Pulsar provides such that, you know, they can boost the performance on their products uh, to then effectively 
uh, market and, and enable their end users for, for uh, their needs. And so uh, you know, our, the, the whole concept here is you know, we're expanding the high performance PNT end user base from what was traditionally very low volume markets to include them, but also to include high volume markets as well. So a little bit about who we are. Um, so we have uh, eight co-founders, which is quite a lot actually, uh, founded by PhDs from Stanford GPS Lab, <clears throat> as well as um, industry veterans in the aerospace industry. I will say, um, so Tyler and a few others um, came from the GPS Lab. Uh, Tyler's advisor's advisor <clears throat> is Brad Parkinson, the, the godfather of GPS. So there's a little bit of a lineage there, uh, and so we um, yeah, we, we, um, there's, there's a little bit of history there, so that's kind of a fun, um, thing, thing that we could think about that came a little bit by chance, but, but we appreciate that and all the connections that, that that's, um, come with. Tyler, his original paper on Leo PNT was, I believe, the first one, as far as I know, um, that was published in modern times, at least, in 2016. Since then, um, Zona was established. We hold several patents now on Leo PNT. And we're at 35 full-time employees and growing. Um, and you can see where we've been really kind of all across the board um, in the aerospace industry and, and, and beyond. I think this might be my last chart here. So we were founded in 2019. Since then, we've done a lot. Uh, we opened our headquarters uh, in 2020. We effectively took our ideas on paper, put that into a lab, demonstrated that it works. The following year, we we took it outside and we demonstrated that it works in the field. Uh, and then we went back to the lab, designed a satellite, developed it, tested it, uh, and has now launched it and are currently operating that test satellite in low Earth orbit. Um, getting a lot of really good uh, test data out of there, doing some on-orbit on tests as we speak. Um, Looking a little bit forward, we have our second demo launch coming up next year. Uh, so you know, when we'll have two in the air, we can do some pretty interesting tests that way. Um, and you know, we're currently ramping up the ground infrastructure, the engineering team, and so on for for production in the near future. Um, all of this has has been possible through um, our great partners um, and, and uh, investors. A couple that I'll um, shout out are Toyota Ventures and Lockheed. Uh, Ventures Toyota is, is clearly a you know big signal that end users in the automotive space are are certainly interested in this. And Lockheed, as I think we all know, are, they, these are the guys that actually build the GPS satellites, right? And so their investment in us is a huge, um, huge signal uh, and vote of confidence that you know this is really the the new wave in in uh, PNT. Um, and then the last thing, just again you know, with with Novatel. Uh, being Hexka and Novatel making a partnership with us is, is really just huge, right? Just we the, a key part to all of this is that you know we're not just broadcasting noise in space. There's actually receivers. There's there's folks on the ground to actually pick that up to, to use that signal uh, for for all sorts of applications and to enable all sorts of modern and new technologies to 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 come up. Um, so that's all I've got. So again, thank you for listening here. I really appreciate it. Um, there's my email to the bottom right if you have any questions or comments. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to my co-presenter, uh, Patrick Shannon from TrustPoint. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so first off, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Shannon. I am CEO and founder of TrustPoint. Uh, and I want to start quickly with a uh, uh, thank you to uh, Arolia and uh, GPS World for this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, TrustPoint, but also just generally uh, Leo GNSS and uh, the features and benefits and, and how it's going to play into some really cool applications. Um, so high level, uh, for folks who may not have heard of TrustPoint or aware of what we're up to, um, we are a VC-backed startup, um, and we are going to be deploying our own constellation of spacecraft to provide new innovative signals uh, and a GPS-like service, uh, all with an eye towards improving upon a bunch of key metrics. Um, we do uh, see a focus uh, 
in the autonomous navigation sector, infrastructure management, and a little further down the line in the augmented reality space. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities also for securing uh, today's applications. And uh, I think that's kind of a, a two sides of the same coin here that the OGNSS can serve. A little more about the company. Uh, we, so we were founded in uh, June of 2020. Um, we closed our initial round of funding uh, last year from Blue Chip Space Investor uh, Data Collective Venture Capital. It was a pretty deep, uh, exciting, and successful space portfolio, so we're, we're very excited about that. Um, we do have two facilities, uh, presence on the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, I'm actually calling in today from Silicon Valley. Uh, we have an office in Mountain View. Um, we also have a team of engineers uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, just north of the Dulles Airport. Um, our team right now is about 10 people, uh, plus uh, advisors and some contractors, um, and a pretty experienced team at that. Uh, our leadership team uh, has a lot of uh, great success stories in industry, building, deploying space-based capabilities, both in the private sector for commercial applications, as well as in the government sector for some pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, and uh, we're able to leverage that, which is great. Um, now, when it comes to our focus, uh, there's obviously a great opportunity to support the support the defense community, uh, whether that's here in the United States or with allied nations abroad. Uh, but we do think the primary target for a majority of Leo PNT capability will actually be in the commercial space. Uh, and some of the features and benefits uh, play there, um, we think, in a more material way initially. And we also think it's a larger market. Um, from a technology focus, because we get this question a lot, you know, where does TrustPoint spend our time? Um, and that uh, really comes down to satellite payloads. Uh, the signals themselves, both the data and the waveform side of that, and then the receivers. Uh, not so much from a receiver technology standpoint, but a receiver design, uh, both software and hardware standpoint. Um, and uh, from uh, the application side, you know, I think it, it's pretty evident. Uh, a lot of folks on the line are going to be very familiar with the sector, but autonomous vehicles, national security, uh, aviation, both manned, unmanned, and piloted. Uh, and then apps and gaming, of course, infrastructure uh, are also big, uh, big sectors we're looking at as a company. Now, um, Brian talked to you a little bit about some of the features uh, that Leo PNT brings, and there has been uh, a decent amount of literature over the last couple of years, um, both um, on, you know, kind of reporting as well as academic uh, and other journal papers on what Leo PNT can do for the industry. Uh, I want to take a moment and just call out a few of, of kind of the key features that TrustPoint in particular is bringing, uh, giving, bringing to market, um, and then uh, kind of go from, from where these features, you know, kind of immediately uh, dovetail into benefits. Uh, so the first one is signal power, um, and, and part of that does come from being in the LEO orbits. Uh, being closer to Earth reduces the path loss. Um, there are some pros and cons there. You do have to have a wider field of view on the spacecraft. So there's a little loss there, um, but it's also worth noting uh, for folks in the line that have a bit of a satellite background, a, a DC watt of power um, on a LEO spacecraft is actually a cheaper resource than one out in NEO. Uh, there's some trades there, but a lot of it comes down to uh, launch mass, the cost of launch, the cost of spacecraft, the size of solar panels, and there's really some really good uh, economics on that front to provide that higher received power on the ground. Uh, the second major feature is encryption. Um, of course, we're all aware that the uh, U.S. government um, and other nation states have encrypted uh, GNSS capabilities. Uh, P codes, M codes, uh, folks are going to be familiar with those signals, um, but there's no current, uh, you know, uh, high-performing signal and that's available to civil and commercial users with encryption. Uh, and so that's something that's going to be new and, and, and often uh, going to be one of the greatest kind of attractors uh, for various markets to some of these services and capabilities. Another big one is going to be frequency diversity. Um, you know, today we have uh, four uh, kind of heritage deployed systems, a couple of commercial augmentation systems that have been deployed, uh, a couple of regional systems that are in deployment currently in India and um, Eastern Pacific area. Um, but as we bring more of these commercial companies online, including TrustPoint, uh, we're going to have access to a lot of different signals with a lot of different frequencies. Um, you guys are probably very familiar with the verbiage of multi-system, uh, multi-channel. Uh, we're also now going to be moving to multi-band. Um, and that's just begun, but I think that's a, a big and exciting field uh, due to some of the resilience and availability uh, that that type of feature set brings. Uh, angular velocity is another big one. You know, obviously being down in low Earth orbit compared to medium Earth orbit, you are 20, 25 times closer to the Earth. It's actually uh, not quite linear, but pretty close when it comes to uh, how the angular velocity across the sky uh, works, depending on your elevation mask. Uh, so the spacecraft are moving fast. Um, that does a couple of cool things for you. 
another cool thing that LEO does, uh, low Earth orbit, is geographic differentiation. Um, and I think this one in particular isn't getting the attention perhaps it should um, from the industry and the various customer segments. And the idea here is when you're in low Earth orbit, uh, you only see, each satellite only sees a small fraction of the Earth uh, at a time. Um, when you're out in MEO or even GEO, um, you see a large portion of the Earth, you know, a third, uh, 40%, depending on where you are. Um, and so you have to provide a service for the most part, unless you're going to use a lot of beam forming, which is expensive. You have to pro provide a service that's pretty consistent globally. Um, and having that global consistency does mean one user can move globally. Um, but if you look at a majority of the users today, uh, they are regionally kind of centric. Um, and there's a great opportunity with LEO spacecraft to uh, essentially customize service, whether that's frequencies, uh, types of modulation and coding, types of encryption, uh, keys in particular. Uh, based on region uh, and uh, the particular use cases for that region or for that, that nation or that, that set of nations. Uh, the last major feature, you know, I want to talk to a little bit, uh, comes from the commercial side, and that's rapid upgrades. And uh, for folks that may be, uh, you know, deep in the uh, defense industrial base, you may have heard about the uh, virtuous cycle and the vicious cycle. Um, this has to do with how fast technology uh, progresses. Um, and the virtual cycle is really talking about iterative design, the ability to build fast, deploy fast, learn, and rebuild and redeploy, um, and how those particular cycles build on one another. Uh, now, today's systems, uh, the Heritage GNSS systems, GPS included, get a refresh roughly every 15 years. And uh, that's great. Um, it, it's always nice to get new spacecraft, new capabilities. Um, but if you can move that 15-year time frame down to five, uh, there's some earlier and better capability that can be brought online. Just as a quick example, if each new generation of spacecraft uh, leads to some sort of maybe tenfold increase in capability spread across a couple of key metrics. Uh, so every generation, you get a 10x improvement. If you're on a 15-year design cycle, you're getting that 10x in 15 years. If you have a competitor or a commercial alternative that can shrink that down to five years, you get that 10x three times in that same 15 years. So you're looking at something that's closer to you know, a thousand-fold increase. Um, and uh, that might sound like a large number, but when you look at other sectors that have implemented these commercial practices and rapid upgrades, you do see that type of capability. Mobile phones is one. Uh, the, the data capacity, processing power, uh, and storage on mobile phones today compared to where they were 15 years ago is on the order of thousands. Um, so that's quite cool. Another major topic I want to talk about, um, and, and this comes up in conversations with customers uh, that kind of come to me and they say, hey, Patrick, you know, GPS has uh, massive resources. Uh, they got hundreds, if not thousands, of people supporting that system. Uh, they've got the backing of the U.S. government and the resources. Uh, they can man, you know, operations 24-7 with redundant crews. And, um, you know, I want to put, you know, safety critical of life applications on my GNSS service. You know, how do I trust that, that a company like TrustPoint or others can go off and perform at that level? Um, I think the, the quick answer is yes, we can absolutely perform at that level. Uh, it's going to take, a, you know, a little bit of time, a couple of years to get there, some kinks to work out for sure. Um, but we're approaching it in a slightly different way than perhaps the, the GPS program and other heritage systems approach it. Um, and, and the term we, we kind of want to, like, point to when it comes to these types of conversations is resilience. Um, this is a word that's very familiar in the defense communities um, and is starting to uh, kind of bleed over into commercial, uh, and I kind of want to help that bleed as, as much as possible. Uh, and I, when I look at resilience, uh, I look at it as having three primary components. Um, the first one is, is graceful degradation, right? You have a system that's on orbit uh, and is supported by a ground infrastructure, um, and things happen, whether it's an adversarial action uh, or something just in nature uh, that causes a portion of that system to go out. Uh, what you would like to have in your system is something called nodal independence. And this is where a single ground station or a single spacecraft or a set of ground stations or a set of spacecraft don't materially impact the rest of the system when they go out. Um, and that's a hard thing to achieve, um, but it's a great thing to achieve if you can do it uh, because then you can lose individual spacecraft, um, and as long as you have the right redundancy in place, uh, the users will be none the wiser. And that's the intent, right? And it's not about not knowing that there's an issue. It's about providing that uptime and availability at the reliability uh, requested by a lot of these groups. Um, so that's graceful degradation. Flexibility is another thing. You know, being frequency, power, mod and encryption agile. Uh, you want to be able to respond when things in the environment respond. 
Um, you know, if we had some of these systems on orbit a couple of years ago, um, as uh, the conflicts in Eastern Europe took place, we could look at modifying signal structures to better support uh, the various use cases in Eastern Ukraine, for instance. And uh, having that flexibility is super important, and I know a lot of folks are pursuing that. Uh, the last one is responsiveness. You know, it's not enough to just have flexibility. You also need to be able to implement it quickly. Um, and that comes from a lot of things like autonomous operations, mobility of the spacecraft on orbit uh, to fill gaps that may exist um, or to kind of densify coverage in certain areas. Um, and then the last, you know, kind of aspect of responsiveness comes from replacement, the ability to replace spacecraft as they uh, are retired uh, or are attacked. And, um, you know, if you look at the GPS spacecraft, um, Block 3, I think they're going for about $600 million delivered on orbit. Uh, it would be very expensive to kind of have a, a set of ground spares or some sort of war reserve for the GPS system. On the commercial side, uh, that's very, very available. Um, you'd be able to stockpile uh, a good portion of the constellation of the ground spare for tens of millions of dollars, uh, which still sounds like a lot of money, but is, is pretty uh, – uh, I guess, meaningful um, and, and uh, achievable, um, given how uh, large this market is and uh, how interested the uh, customer base is. Now, um, I've talked a little bit about the features, and, and features are good, um, but it's, uh, it's as important or more so to uh, talk about the actual tangible benefits from those features. Um, so down the middle of this slide, you'll see uh, the various features in their icon form uh, from two slides ago. Um, and this is intended to be an illustrative uh, graphic here. Um, I think there's a lot more arrows and a lot more one-to-one uh, -one matchings um, than I'm showing currently. Um, but just to call out a few, um, I think are important. Uh, you know, increasing the signal power at the user uh, helps a lot of things. Um, it, it immediately helps precision, uh, and I'm sure we're all aware of the relationship between signal noise ratio and accuracy. Um, but it also helps cost, uh, the ability to use less sophisticated antennas for those larger, um, more, uh, more demanding applications. Some of these applications have antennas, for instance, that are um, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Um, and a lot of that comes from some of the, the capabilities that have been built into those antennas uh, to help make up for the signal power, low signal power of GPS uh, and some of the weaknesses that result from that. Um, another one is, is the frequency um, diversity. And, the ability to, um, you know, leverage multiple frequencies as they're available in your area, um, you know, that, that gives you some opportunities to operate and have availability in denied areas. And those could be adversarially denied or they could be, um, you know, things like deep urban canyons. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see from a geographic standpoint, uh, having diverse applications or diverse signal sets in different areas, uh, you can improve upon integrity. Um, if there's a specific region of the world that want to uh, group their encryption keys um, and, and kind of operate as, as a single user base, uh, that becomes available in LEO. Um, and that might be uh, more attractive to folks uh, than for perhaps using, you know, the same encryption keys uh, as other users in other parts of the world. Um, just quickly, and there's a, there's a lot of words on this slide, but you know, I want to call out two particular use cases and, and kind of applications that are, um, you know, pretty attracted to what uh, Leo p t has to bring uh, to the market. Uh, the first one is, is the move to small cell mobile networks. And when you look at how uh, the architecture of mobile, mobile networks, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, with the move from 2G to 3G, and then more recently the move from 3G to 4G, and now the initial um, strong deployments of 5G, uh, the size of the cellular um, I guess uh, coverage area per base station has decreased dramatically. You know, we go from a single station covering um, tens of square, square, square kilometers down to, you know, femto and pico cells that are covering a street corner um, or an alleyway. Um, and when you look at that, each of those cellular base stations needs to have time and synchronization. Um, but the quantity of them has now increased and will only continue to increase as we look to make more, more use of, of spectrum reuse strategies. Uh, to the point where, you know, you have now tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of more base stations that have that same timing requirement. Um, and to do that, you have to make those stations a lot cheaper than those big macro cells a decade plus ago. Um, and uh, a lot of the cost savings you can get from a Leo p t solution uh, would support the proliferation of these networks uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, same thing on drone delivery um, or, uh, you know, drone drone operations in general. Um, you've got the beyond line of sight autonomy requirements. 
uh, these particular platforms incredibly sensitive to power and mass and volume. Um, you know, an additional sensor takes away from payload mass pretty materially. Um, so reducing, you know, the size of your avionics guidance and navigation systems from both a volume and a mass standpoint and power standpoint, super important. Increases range and payload capacity per system. That lets you address a larger area um, with, your, with your platform. Um, and these are also dynamic platforms, mobile platforms. And um, to that extent, uh, they need to have a capability uh, that can handle that. Now, Leo GNSS and GNSS in particular is really good for drones. Um, they don't necessarily have access to a lot of the other phenomenologies that land-based autonomous systems have. Uh, you can't, you know, beef them up with all sorts of radar and LIDAR and optical systems. You might be able to get away with one of those and still maintain uh, the right kind of platform dynamics and capability. Um, but a small, low power, low size, weight, and cost uh, RF-based system like GNSS, and in particular what you can do with Leo GNSS, uh, is going to be a big kind of boon to this particular sector. Um, and uh, just to wrap up quickly, um, you know, to give, give folks on the line a bit of an understanding where TrustPoint stands today and, and where we're going. Uh, we've made a lot of progress since our funding last year. Um, and we really have our eye on, um, you know, uh, early midsummer of next year uh, as, it, as it pertains to uh, getting some pilot programs going. Um, so we're actively signing up customers, and if there are folks on the line that are interested in, uh, in that type of opportunity, please let us know, um, and we'll have the ability to leverage some initial satellite capability as well as our Armstrong Gen 1 receiver technology. And uh, I'll just uh, reiterate, please feel free to reach out at any time. Happy to talk Leo p &T. Um, could do so all day. And with that, I will hand off to my fellow co-presenter, Zach. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Can I just a confirmation that uh, everyone can hear me and see my first slide? Okay. Yes, we can. So, all right, thank you. So first of all, thanks for GPS World and Orolia for inviting me to present on this webinar. And of course, I appreciate the opportunity to, sit, to share the stage with Brian, Patrick, and Alaya. So what I wanna show you today is some of the exciting work coming out of my lab at the Ohio State University and the US Department of Transportation Center, which we call CARMEN which stands for the Center for Automated Vehicle Research with Multimodal Assured Navigation. Now, we are interested in securing the navigation system for highly automated vehicles, whether they are ground, aerial, or maritime, uh, via various technologies. I will focus this talk, obviously, on LEO satellites and showing you what we can do with existing and potentially future LEO mega constellations. So I will not repeat what was mentioned earlier by Brian and Patrick, but just LEO satellites is really uh, 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 revolutionizing uh, radio navigation and satellite-based navigation. They offer us a lot of exciting opportunities. For example, they uh, are received at a much higher power, signal power that is compared to NEO uh, or medium Earth orbit satellites where global, current global navigation satellite systems reside. They are also abundant. Uh, this chart here on the right-hand side, top right-hand side, shows you that in 2019, about 2,200 LEO satellites were in orbit, and a, a recent estimate uh, uh, was conducted where it showed that by 2029, that number could grow to about 57,000 satellites in LEO. So it's gonna be quite crowded up there. They also offer us geometric diversity given the different orbits that they will be launched into. And of course, they will offer us spectral diversity. So what I will show you today are some results where we have exploited signals in the VHF band all the way to the KU band, uh, which obviously gives us resiliency uh, if one band is jammed or spoofed or otherwise, we can rely on other LEO bands for secure navigation. And very interestingly for our type of approach, these signals are free. So what I'll be showing you today is how to explode those signals in an opportunistic fashion where we are really not paying a dime for any of the LEO 
uh, uh, orbit satellite operators who are just using their signals for free, which is what we had done in the past with cellular signals. And uh, obviously, other researchers have exploited terrestrial signals of opportunity in general, ranging from digital TV and Wi-Fi and others for navigation. However, as we all know, there is no free lunch. Uh, so uh, unless, of course, your mom is, pay, is, is making you lunch that it's free because she loves you. But nevertheless, there are challenges that we have to account for to exploit those LEO satellite signals for navigation. The first is their signals are mysterious. So unless you are a subscriber to the network and unless they are transmitting some PNT signal for you, you really don't know what's going on in the signal. So I will show you later in my, school, in my presentation how we actually exploited those mysterious signals and we deciphered them enough to uh, 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 navigate with them. The second is that we, the, the satellites suffer from large ephemeris errors from our point of view. So unlike GNFS, which transmits their ephemeris to the uh, user in the navigation message, of course, GNSS satellites are designed for PNT. LEO satellites do not open, necessarily openly transmit their ephemeris to you. So what you typically rely on are things like two-line element files and SGP4 propagators and so forth, which could accumulate errors ranging from one up to five kilometers uh, uh, in error, which obviously would translate into some uh, localization and timing errors for the user. And I will show you later how we can, uh, how my lab was able to compensate for these ephemeris errors. The third challenge is that the clocks on board those satellites, those LEO satellites, are not as synchronized nor as stable as GNSS. So many of the constellations are meant for broadband communication. They are not designed for PNT, so we just can't expect them to equip their, 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 their satellites with high-quality atomic like clocks like GNSS satellites. So I will show you also how we can compensate for that. And finally, uh, given the uh, uh, wide spectrum that those satellites will be transmitting their signals at, we will suffer from different types of ionospheric and tropospheric delay. So I like to think of LEO-based PNT solutions to be classified into one of three different categories. And of course, as an academic, uh, this is just a standard academic slide with some very, very brief literature review of some of the most impactful work that has been done. Uh, and apologies if you don't see your work there. This is just a sample. So one approach is what we call PNT dedicated LEO. So the idea here is you are specifically transmitting a signal from LEO satellites for PNT purposes, kind of what Zona is, is trying to do. The other approach is LEO augmented GNSS. So here you are fusing GNSS and LEO signals simultaneously for several, uh, 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 which actually is a problem that has been looked at for more than two decades now. Uh, and, and some of the early work by Matthew Jurger and coming from the Stanford uh, lab has, has looked at this particular class of problems. And the third which is what my lab is focusing on among other researchers in the community is fully opportunistic LEO. So the LEO satellite is transmitting some signals and the idea is how can we exploit it for PNT and get some good results with it. And that's what I will be showing you later on. This just shows you, uh, I just like this slide because it shows you how the LEO satellites will sort of form a blanket cover around Earth when the constellations are, are fully launched and fully deployed. On the bottom left, you can see the future projected uh, LEO constellations and their numbers. You know, this is why they call them mega constellations. And of course, the granddaddy of all is Starlink, which is hoping to launch as many as 42,000 satellites into LEO. Of course, these numbers keep changing. I try to keep updating these tables, but just, it just gives you an idea of, of, of the sheer quantity of satellites that will blanket cover our Earth. So the first set of results I want to show you were from Starlink itself. Uh, in fact, this work was featured in Science uh, in last September and in ISOPLE Spectrum last October. 
uh, because we were the first in the world to show how you can exploit Starlink signals and decipher them to get a navigation solution. If you are interested in this work, you can refer to these two papers that were published this year in the IEEE Transactions on Aerospace and Electronic Systems. Without getting into too many details, we developed two different approaches for the problem. One is a carrier phase approach, and the other one is a blind Doppler approach, where in the carrier phase approach, we managed to get a two-dimensional root mean squared error of 7.7 .7 meters from the ground truth. So this is very, very close to what you get with GPS, and I should say this is with six Starlink satellites. Uh, and then in the blind Doppler approach, we were only off by 10 meters. Now, when we took the Starlink receiver that we developed and fused it with an Iridium and an Orcom receiver that we had developed earlier, uh, basically using signals from one Orcom satellite, four Iridium satellites, and six Starlink satellites, we put everything together and we managed to get a final error of six and a half meters. And you can see in this figure on the right, where the uh, true receiver position was, which was basically on the roof of, of, of a parking structure, and how close our final estimate, and you can see here the 99th percentile ellipse showing how, how accurate we can do. And I should emphasize that this is fully opportunistic. We are simply listening to the satellite signals, and we are using their signals to localize ourselves. We have receivers that are cognitive that can do this trick. The next thing I want to show you is, is, is some of our most recent work where basically I want to caution you about the timing issues of LEO and, and leave you with, with some food for thought here about what kind of clocks do these LEO have. Obviously, we don't necessarily know. They do not tell us. So we conducted an experiment on an ORCOM satellite uh, to, to try to characterize the stability of its clock. And the way we, the reason we focus on ORCOM is that it turns out they do transmit their ephemeris, so we don't have to worry about estimating their uh, uh, ephemeris as well. So we are only trying to estimate their timing, and their bias and drift, and the, the, the stability of their clock. So what you are seeing here in green, this is the true antenna position, or this true receiver position. We initialized our filter with some estimates, it was about uh, one and a half kilometers away. We waited for an Orcom satellite to fly over us, and we used its signals to try to localize ourselves. Now, in the absence of knowledge of what kind of a clock does the Orcom satellite have, you can be, I would, I would argue, either a conservative or a liberal or an optimist. So if you are a conservative, you say, well, I will, in my extended time on poker, I will assume that the satellite has a pretty, uh, 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 a typical quality temperature compensated crystal oscillator. So it's not the best oscillator out there. I'm conservative. Let's see what we get. So if that's the case, you will get this yellow pin, which is obviously an improvement over where you started at. And this is the uncertainty element. Now, if you are an optimist, you say, no, I think that those satellites are great and they are equipped with a very high quality oven compensated, uh, oven controlled crystal oscillator, OCXO. And if you do that, you will get this purple pen. What's dangerous about this purple pen or about this approach is that you are gonna get an inconsistent estimate. Your filter will be very sure of itself and will be very wrong. Now, what we have done in this study is we adaptively estimated the clock stability on the ORCOM satellite, and we managed to get this blue pin, and you see that we are consistent with, uh, our filter was consistent. And you see here in this table, the improvement in the final error, and I have to remind you, this is with a single ORCOM satellite, we were able to localize ourselves to 111.26 meters. If you are conservative, 254.7 meters, and if you are an optimist, it's 429, and what's scary about being very optimistic is that you will be inconsistent. So the next thing I want to show you is some results on a moving platform, on a moving vehicle, and this is a framework that we developed in my lab called SAN, Simultaneous Tracking and Navigation, which basically uh, attempts to aid the INS 
with observables extracted from the satellite. We also add, on top of that, estimating where the LEO satellites are in space. And we also estimate their clock. So kind of, it, it, it's a very large uh, estimation problem. We pretty much estimate everything. So this work was featured on the cover of Inside GNSS uh, uh, in the December 2021 issue. So I will show you some of the results we achieved with the SAN framework with multi-constellation LEO. And once again, we don't know what the signals they are transmitting. We designed receivers that are cognitive that could exploit the signals. We are estimating now where the satellites are in space, and we are estimating their clock, okay? So we drove the vehicle over this trajectory for 4.15 kilometers, total time 150 seconds. We cut GPS fictitiously at one point to look at the difference between the unaided uh, INS and the aided INS via LEO. So we traveled for 70 seconds without GNSS for 1.82 kilometers. We used signals from two Orpcom, one Iridium, and three Starlink satellites that were above us. And the unaided GNSS, by the end of the trajectory, it has accumulated the position root mean squared error of 118.47 meters. The LEO aided INS reduced that to 18.43 meters. So, you may think, well, this is still a lot of error, but I have to remind you, we are, we are not using as many LEO satellites. That's number one. Number two, we really don't know what, necessarily know what they are transmitting. We are trying to cognitively decipher that. And number three, we are estimating their ephemeris. But if you are curious into a glimpse to the future of what this framework could give you, this simulation here shows a, an unmanned aerial vehicle navigating with this stand framework and this cognitive framework that I discussed earlier, where we simulated the full Starlink constellation, one is up, and up there, 74 Starlink satellites, two Orphan satellites, one Iridium Next satellite. And when you do that, if you are doing a LEO Doppler aided INS, I can guarantee you about 10.6 meters in position root mean squared error. And if you are doing a pseudo range aided, INS, then we can bring this down to 7.31 meters. And once again, to remind you, we are simultaneously estimating where the satellites are. In the bottom left figure, you see how accurate we are in estimating them in space. So with that, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the funding agencies for my lab, specifically the Office of Naval Research and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Department of Transportation, and I also thank NIST and Sandia who have been funded funding relevant projects in my lab. And with that, I will turn it to Alaya. Hey, thank you, Zach. Um, as Zach said, my name is Alaya. I am an Applications Engineer at Aurelia Defense and Security. Uh, I'm going to change gears a little from talking about the constellations themselves to talking about simulation. So I'll talk about the importance of simulation in response to the development of new constellations. As more technology utilizes satellites for PNT information, it's integral to develop ways to test the functionality of PNT systems before they are deployed. So I'm going to talk about the benefits of developing a test environment for LEO constellations alongside the development of these constellations themselves and how a flexible system is best equipped for the advent of LEO constellations. Simulation can be implemented at various stages of the process by developing uh, simulation of the new constellations alongside the development of the constellation of the PNT system. That system can be thoroughly tested before the satellites are deployed. This can further streamline the process between the developers of the constellation and of the receivers uh, for a quick feedback loop in design. Developing simulation hand-in-hand -hand with developing the constellations has several advantages. It can lead to increased communication with receiver developers and uh, give more insight in addition to the modeling. It also means that the simulation capability can be available along with the introduction of the constellation itself. In the past, there have been instances of the constellation being deployed 
but there being few ways for the receiver manufacturers to test the solution, slowing down the development process. By testing with simulation, developers have the ability to test the functionality early on in the development process, rather than awaiting deployment of the constellations for a chance to field test. Receivers and systems can be tested during uh, development for problem scenarios, such as GPS denied environments via canyons or other outages, uh, or uh, other outages of their satellites and other types of vulnerabilities. This can give developers a head start in vetting unforeseen issues for the receiver using the constellation. After implementation, simulation can be used to repeat any problems encountered in field tests for faster and more effective testing. Fixes can be implemented in a lab setting before going out again for field testing. This can save time and resources as there's no need to go all the way to the field test stage every time a problem arises or just to test the fix. So this can speed up the development process and save uh, time and money. Another reason to develop simulation alongside with the development of the constellations is the development time on the simulator end. Um, so it's always going to take some time to simulate things, but once a new constellation is ready to be used, you don't want the receiver manufacturers to be waiting on development uh, because they have no way to simulate and they have to wait for a simulation test bed to further development. Some types of simulators take more time to develop uh, the ability to simulate new constellations than others, uh, as they may need to develop new software, hardware, or a combination of both that can support the new constellation. That being said, there are two types of simulators. There are hardware-defined simulators and software-defined simulators. Hardware-defined simulators use FPGAs to create these signals. Earlier, GSG-5 and 6 are examples of these. They have six hardware channels, and they're designed and programmed to output specific types of signals. Because of this design, to add new constellations would require some type of hardware upgrade, as both hardware and software would need to be designed to digest the new, uh, to digest and produce new constellations. Uh, these evolutions might take years. These types of simulators uh, can also be constrained to be project specific. They might have a limited number of signals due to SPGA channels being available. Uh, and they are generally slow and arduous to produce new constellations or features. Software-defined architecture, such as the Broadson product line, uh, provides a more dynamic simulator. These simulators are future-proofed. Uh, as they can grow and change with new constellations or change with old ones. These systems uh, also can take advantage of COTS products to increase system performance. This means two things. One, that rather than focusing on hardware improvements, the engineers can focus on the simulation side of the system. And two, the upgrade cycles are possible more frequently. The software-defined systems like Broadson also provide open source libraries and plugins to increase the capability of their simulation solutions. One benefit of software-defined simulation systems regarding LEO constellations is that the GPU can handle the generation of more signals than the traditional FPGA-driven simulation solutions. This is because in a true software-defined system, there are no fixed hardware channels limiting the number of signals that can be generated. This is a benefit in LEO constellations especially, as there are more satellites in LEO orbit than there are in the GNSS constellations that have been simulated in the past. As we saw on uh, Zach's diagrams, there are thousands of those where there were significantly less in the GNSS band. Another benefit being that if you ever do reach the limit, uh, you can add a GPU and continue using the same simulation tool. So it doesn't require too many changes. Uh, which brings me to another big benefit, the flexibility of the system. So as new constellations are added uh, with the addition of new software rather than the addition of new hardware, uh, the new constellations can be available to developers. That means developers can have access to those new constellations with just a software update. In fact, using Broadsim as an example, uh, we've seen more constellations become available in the tool as new constellations and signals have been introduced or constellations have been more commonly used, such as QZSS, Bidou, 
and the introduction of the introduction of M code. Our broad case scenario gives the ability to test how receivers or whole systems work during specific scenarios, giving users the ability to see all NG satellites, see how terrain may affect your system, and provide refresh rates that translate into real-time processing for fast-moving applications. Uh, giving you the capability to test acquisition times, to view relative power data, uh, and collect data to further your development, as well as automation capability to speed up your testing setup. Uh, so how can this be applied to uh, the new constellations that we've seen from other presenters, as well as new ones in general? Uh, we've seen some of these additions already happening with existing Leo constellations. Using Grodson, powered by Skydell, there are multiple built-in ways uh, of simulating Leo constellations. One such way is using the plugin tool. This uh, tool allows users to develop features and integrate them into the Grodson user interface and real-time simulation engine. We've already had success in creating Leo constellations using this tool. Grodson also gives the ability to modify existing constellations with your own custom signal and the addition of data sets to manipulate orbital and ephemeris data. Now, this is an example of the flexibility that comes with using a software-defined system. In the future, you can expect to see a growing list of constellations available within the tool. If you would like to see your constellation simulated within the broad sim, you can contact Aurelia Defense and Security with your ICD, uh, and we can help you to simulate your constellation. Uh, so, in conclusion, the benefits of developing simulation capability alongside with the development of the constellations allow simulators to be available to designers when they need them, and those simulators can aid in the design process by allowing rapid testing and development, speeding up time to market, and increasing cost savings by reducing field test cycles and hours. Software-defined simulators are equipped to handle Leo constellations. They are not limited in the number of signals that they can produce by hardware. They are agile in that they can increase available constellations without needing any hardware upgrades. New features and constellations are available with just a software upgrade, and uh, the user community can create new ways to use the tool. Our Broadsim already has initial support for Leo simulation using the plugin tool, and we would like to partner with you to integrate your Leo constellation into the Broadsim. Uh, thanks for your time, uh, and thank you, GPS World. I'm going to pass it back to Mackenzie. Great. Thank you all so much. That was awesome. At this time, we're going to jump into some questions we received during registration and a couple we got during the presentation. Um, the first question I have is, what positioning accuracy has been demonstrated for indoor and outdoor positioning with LEO satellite navigation? Maybe I can take that one. So with what, what's typically referred to as the non-cooperative LEO approach or the opportunistic LEO approach that we had shown earlier, experimentally, we showed that you can get to less than 10 meter accuracy with existing constellations on a stationary receiver outdoors and on a vehicle when you couple it with an IMU you can reduce the drift from a tactical grade GNSS aided IMU uh, with a LEO aided IMU instead from by more than 90%. When of course you don't have GNSS. So with with today's constellations, you can get pretty impressive accuracy. Of course, you can't get the submeter level accuracy that you can get with GNSS RTK. But with more and more constellation, uh, Leo constellations out there, we will be getting to that point. Yeah, this is Brian here. You can chime in. At least for us, uh, we see a, a huge need in decimeter, like 10 centimeter level performance or better. And that's certainly something that, that we intend to hit. Um, I think a, another question related to this is, well, what are the integrity levels on top of that? 
um, and, and you know, what are the accuracies on that? And that, that's a very hard question that, that we are working through. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge need for that, and that's certainly something that, that we're designing towards. Great. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, there has been some work looking at hosting of PNT payloads. Patrick, has TrustPoint looked at the hosting architectures? And can you talk to the pros and cons of that approach versus having devoted spacecraft? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, TrustPoint did take a lot of time, and I think there's been uh, additional work throughout the industry looking at how you might host uh, or co-host uh, PNT-related payloads on spacecraft. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, pros from the standpoint of shared satellite resources, shared operations. Um, you know, even systems engineering at the large scale uh, can generate some synergies. Um, however, I think there's also a lot of detractors. And in particular, uh, TrustPoint has, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, moved away from hosting approaches. I don't think it's off the trade space completely, uh, but the detractors, you know, the programmatics get very complex. Um, there are different orbits that are beneficial for GNSS-related activ activities and applications um, that aren't necessarily the best for other applications like a broadband system or, um, you know, observation or observation, whether it's optical, SAR, or otherwise. And, and so why hosting opportunities, you know, as the market grows, become more and more prevalent, um, it, it becomes programmatically difficult. You know, there's also CONOP uh, impl implications as well. Um, there are spacecraft that are going to be slowing, that are going to be duty cycling their, their systems, and, you know, PNT and GNSS in particular uh, is, is kind of intended and, and best used in 100% duty cycle, uh, either nadir staring or target tracking, and, um, you know, that becomes a conflict when you're looking at a lot of other payloads and, and what their particular applications require. So uh, it's a good approach, but I think a devoted system uh, is definitely the way to go. It's the route that TrustPoint is pursuing. Um, you know, fully devoted spacecraft uh, and a custom-built optimized system um, is, uh, you know, yeah, is, is where our conclusions have, have rested. Okay, great. All right, that was all the time we have today. So thank you all for attending today's webinar, A Galaxy Far, Far Away, Why Leo PNT is Closer to Reality Than You Think. Brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Arolia Defense and Security. If you have additional questions for myself or for our speakers, please feel free to reach out using the emails you see on the screen. We hope you'll join us again soon for another great webinar.